to uh, Shattering Mist. We're going to return to our presentation of the Torah account of man's creation, uh, as well as the nature of the relationship that God envisioned. We were speaking of this at the end of our program yesterday, and we're going to return to the statement that Yahweh made in Barashith 2.7, where he said, Yahweh, Almighty, formed for association and accompaniment, Adam, man, from the natural material particles of the ground. And he blew into his nostrils a life-giving, restoring, and sustaining conscience. And the Salma, uh, ability to exercise good judgment. And Adam came to exist as a living soul. God is, uh, has declared the reason for creation. He wanted to have a relationship with this unique creature, mankind. And he gave us a conscience, a seat of judgment, so that we could distinguish between right and wrong. He gave us a living soul, so that we could uh, be observant and respond to what we came to know about him. And here is not only God doing so, but in his very name, he explains the purpose for creation. He reached out his hand to lift this man up. That's the first letter in Yahweh's name. And, of course, the following three are two people standing, mother and father, husband and wife. Adam and Sarah, our heavenly father and spiritual mother, to, to be both beside the Hebrew letter for wa, which means to increase, to add to, to secure. It's a tent peg making a home larger and more impervious against the elements. So here's Yahweh, Almighty, forming for the purpose of association and accompaniment, Adam, mankind, from the natural particles of the ground, and he blew into his nostrils. This life-sustaining conscience, it came from God. It's a spiritual thing that enables us to relate to spiritual things, as well as our living soul. Therefore, the living soul, known as man, was the last animal God created on the sixth day. He fashioned us male and female. That's not to say, by the way, that he doesn't uh, have an affinity for the other animals. He does. In fact, he said so. In eternity, there will be other animals enjoying eternity. God has said so. First thing that we find Yahweh doing with Adam is parading uh, all of the various life forms that he had conceived before Adam so that they could enjoy them. He said so. So here was this uh, animal, humankind, that God created on the sixth day. He fashioned us male and female, as with uh, all other forms of life, from the natural elements of the earth by manipulating the DNA code, which is a language. It's not an ordinary language. It's a three-dimensional language. But it's a language. But something was different about the species Homo sapien. God designed a unique animal with a special capacity to think, not that we do it very often anymore, to communicate, <laughs> not that we're very good at that anymore. To be creative, unfortunately, we use most of our creative and destructive creativity in destructive ways these days, and to be productive. We don't... Uh, not very good at that anymore either, are we? To walk upright, that's something we don't do a lot of anymore either. We're pretty immoral as a species. And to conceive and raise children in a loving and nurturing family. That's something of a bygone era as well, isn't it, for most? Teaching and protecting them in a manner which would embrace the covenant he envisioned. Our very nature is symbolic of Yahweh's character and purpose. We are the residue of God's design, the living embodiment of his plan. In this regard, of the millions of animal forms on earth, man is unlike any other. Unlike the others, our species was crafted in the likeness of God. 
Simply stated, if you can picture a man and a woman who are husband and wife standing before the protective shelter of their home with a child between them, then you can envision Yahweh and understand his purpose. It is that simple. It really is. The totality of the Torah. It is that simple. Family, home, mother, wife, marriage, children, protection, love, nurturing, growing, the enjoyment of relationships. There really is nothing more to it than that. And yet, isn't that the most glorious thing that exists anywhere in the universe? After watching his special creation for some unspecified period of time, God took a member of our species, named him Adam, and he gave him a nesama, a conscience, so that he could begin a relationship with his solitary soul. Yahweh designed and built a perfect paradise for him, and he placed Adam inside. And hoping that we'd come to appreciate God's perspective on all of this is the reason that the creation account of Adam and Chawa is told twice. Once, generally, of all uh, humankind, and once specifically from the perspective of these two unique individuals. This vantage point on humankind, on those both inside and outside of Yah's protection, suggests that they were divergent only in the sense that Adam and Chawa had a nasama, a conscience, which enabled Adam and Chawa and those born after them to develop a personal relationship with God. We can think. We can reason. It's the one thing that makes us different. It's the, it is the single aspect of humankind that enables us to know Yahweh and to understand what he is offering. It is why political correctness from the institutions of man, his religious institutions, his political institutions, his media institutions, his academic institutions, all vociferously attack good judgment with political correctness. It is that one aspect of human nature that makes it possible for us to know God and not only understand what he is offering, but capitalize upon it. So if we use our nasama, our seat of judgment, we can come to engage in a relationship with God or we can reject him. This enables the choice that is required for love. But using their disama or seat of judgment poorly, Adam and Chawa were banished from the garden, separated from God, and exposed to the rest of the world, even to the rest of humanity. If I'm right, including this time in paradise, Adam would have lived 1,000 years. And in this way, he came to symbolize mankind's first millennium. These things considered, it matters not if my time estimate is accurate. My purpose is only to provide you with a scenario which is both plausible and completely consistent with both scripture and science. Humankind is a special animal, and Adam and Chawa were especially unique as a couple. Their ancestry is common, but not their conscience. Now, returning to the known and certain, Yahweh provided Adam with some directions. He has done the same for you and for me. Let's read his directions. I'm going to share this from Barashith, which means in the beginning, 216. And Yahweh, Almighty, provided direction beside, near, on behalf of Adam, the man, saying, eat and consume food from every one of the sheltered gardens trees. As it is with us, the Creator's prescriptions for living are contained in His Word. Today we should think of Scripture, the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms as God's source of good food 
that which is nourishing, that which will, when consumed, will cause us to grow and be healthy. And how is it? Eat. I have provided this instruction for you. If we want to find God's instruction and be nourished by it, read the Torah, the book that is named Instruction. Now, you'll notice in this statement that Yahweh didn't cry out from above, from a distant heaven. He said that he was all near, beside Adam when he spoke. That's very significant. Further, since Eden is a word picture of a protective place of great joy that is conducive to life, when we spend our eternity exploring the universe, this verse suggests that there will be a countless variety of good options from which to select. Life living with God in all eternity is not going to be boring. God gave Adam choices. As God endeavored to share it, for there to be love, of course, there must be choice. So, he says, but from the tree of the knowledge, this is diat, the acquisition of information with a focus on discernment, judgment, moral application, and understanding, of good, tobe, that which is prosperous, beneficial, and proper, and bad, that which is harmful, morally inappropriate, malignant, and disagreeable. Do not eat from it. 2.17 in Barashith. Now, he had already said that every tree was good, beneficial, prosperous. There was one distinction on this tree. This tree provided knowledge regarding that which was bad. You see, in eternity, we will have already chosen, everyone who spends eternity with Yahweh will already have chosen to engage in a relationship with him. We will have chosen to love him because we came to know him and we embraced his offer. So, here, at this time, God created a perfect environment for Adam and for Chawa that said, you know, you still have to have a choice to distance yourself from me. Otherwise, there is no free will and there can be no love. And so amongst all of the good, he provided a tree that was different only than it gave the option for man to know that which was bad. So here as we listen to Yah's teaching, uh, his instruction, from uh, the uh, garden, we are told that, that we had the capacity to understand both good and evil, to be able to discern between them. And so there was a source for that information presented in the midst of the garden so that we would have the opportunity to choose bad versus good, to choose not God instead of God. And Adam and Chawa made that choice. They could eat from the tree of every other tree in the garden, all of which was good, without consequence to their relationship, save one. In a way, the lone path amongst countless choices which lead away from camping out with Yahweh in paradise is akin to this, the singular way that God has provided back home. There are an infinite number of, of uh, fruitless options, but there's only one that leads us directly to God. The product of choice is uh, is consequence. The product of choice is consequence. That's why we spend so much time in that first hour considering the consequence of our choices. And nationally, religiously, militarily, economically, we've made very poor choices, and the consequences have been grievous. Now, if you choose God, you get to live with him. That is the most beneficial option. If you opt to reject God, however, based upon whatever knowledge you obtain, you will die separated from him. This is the inferior selection. 
Yahweh says, indeed, because in the day that you eat from it, you will become mortal and die. Now, there's a lot of people that just have a conniption fit with this because uh, Adam and Chawa uh, ate from the uh, the tree of the knowledge of uh, good and evil, and they didn't immediately die. And said, see, see there's, a, there's a contradiction. No, it just says they'll become mortal. They're, they will become mortal, and they will die. And they did. Now, God has a remedy for that, and his remedy is the covenant. Within the covenant, God says, walk to me and become perfect. God created a path for his covenant children to resolve the consequence of death. And since the consequence of choosing not God to disagree with, to oppose his instructions... Since the consequence, the first consequence of disagreeing with, ignoring, rebelling against Yahweh's Torah instructions is death, what's the first step on the path to life? Passover. What does it resolve? The consequence of sin, which is death. And so God provided the answer right there. The doorway made up of the same wood of the tree. Yes. It was upon the pillars, the upright pillars of that doorway, that the blood of the Passover lamb was to be shed, just as the Passover lamb, as Yosha, on Passover. In year 4000 Yah, 33 CE, in our pagan calendars, enabled the doorway to heaven, the doorway to life, by shedding the blood of the perfect Passover lamb on that doorway. And so that was the consequence, he said, of feeding from this tree. You're going to die. And God now has a remedy for that, which is Passover. The first step on the way to him remedies the initial consequence of being mortal. Being mortal does not mean that we die instantly. I'm mortal. You're mortal. We live. But one day we will die. The question for us is, are we going to reject Yahweh's instructions and stay that way? Are we going to embrace them? Or are we going to listen to what he says and walk to him through the doorway of life so that he can adopt us in his family? That really is the choice that is before all of us. So this is the first time the consequence for rejecting Yahweh's direction has been specified. Now this is really powerful, my friends. It's death, the end of life. And that means that the consequence of disregarding Yah's instruction is not eternal suffering. You know, the religion of Christianity, the religion of Islam, the two biggest religions on earth today, both say that if you don't acquiesce to their edicts, that you'll spend eternity in hell. They want you to accept their teachings so that you don't go to hell. Did God say that the consequence of disregarding what I'm offering to you as guidance and instruction is eternal torment in hell? Or did he say it was just the end of your mortal existence? It's really important to know what God said as opposed to what religions say. We'll be back in a moment. So my friends, indeed, it is the, um, this is a very powerful line when God said, indeed, because in the day that you eat from it, you will become mortal and die. God uh, expressed the consequence of us ignoring his instructions. It isn't hell. Just let that soak in. You know, the first of perhaps a hundred profound insights that are contained in yadayah.com, intro to god.org, uh, questioningpaul.com. There are a hundred, perhaps more, insights that 
really are all from Yah's testimony to us, but either were unknown or not commonly known prior to presenting it in those books. The first of those, the first profound insight that I came to is I just said, I'm going to wipe away religious indoctrination. I'm going to wipe away all of the crud that I have been told to believe. And I'm going to look at the words that he chose to use and just consider the implications of those words. The first profound insight was that the consequence of sin is not eternal damnation. That God did not say, if you choose to ignore my instructions, I'm going to see to it that you're tortured forever in hell. The consequence of sin is not hell. That there are three destinations for human souls, and God makes it abundantly clear that those who ignore his instructions simply cease to exist. That is what he has said here. If you do not pay attention to my instructions, you're going to die. Faith is irrelevant. Y'all, they knew he was God. Their faith, therefore, was wholly and completely irrelevant. The thing that was relevant is that God provided instructions, and he said, I'm, going, I'm not going to change my mind. These are my instructions. If you choose to ignore or disregard my instructions, you're going to die. The nature of events as they stand right now for all of us. And so the first profound insight that I was able to glean as I studied God's word with an open mind was that there are three destinations for our outcomes, if you will, for human souls. And that the vast preponderance of human souls simply cease to exist. God says it over and over and over again. If you don't heed my instructions, you're going to die. That's it. That's a consequence. It's not a punishment. Choice requires consequence. That's the consequence. Think of how profound that is, though. If you're an agnostic, chances are you're a thinking individual. And one of the reasons that you've rejected the notion of God in Christianity as an agnostic is you recognize that a God who would say, love me, or I'm going to see to it that you're tortured in hell, isn't lovable. Just as we pointed out with the President of the United States, if he thinks that the threat of mass murder is going to create a desirable diplomatic solution, he's crazy. You can't get someone to respect you by threatening to kill them. God didn't say, I'm going to kill you if you don't follow my instructions. He said, I gave you mortal life. It's just that will be it. The end of your mortal life, if you choose to reject my instructions, you're going to die. He didn't say, I'm going to kill you. He says, you're just going to die. You're mortal. It's a consequence. It's not a punishment. You get your life. You've got the three gifts that God offers all of us. A soul, which is the gift of mortal life, free will, and a conscience, so that we can capitalize upon our mortality to come to know Yahweh and understand what he is offering so that we accept rather than reject his instructions. And then he says we will live forever with him. That's the second option. If they had heeded, paid attention to, embraced, not rejected Yahweh's instructions, they would have lived forever with him in perfect joyous conditions. That's the same offer that God gives to us. So there is a third option. Now, that third option is not specified here, but it's specified elsewhere. And that third option is that if we choose to lead others astray, if we choose to beguile them, if we choose to be advocates for religion as opposed to victims of religion, if we choose to be propagandists for patriotism as opposed to victims of politics and patriotism, if we advance academic notions of political correctness as opposed to we are diminished by political correctness as students, 
the perpetrators of such crimes against God and against humanity will be punished. There is a place of eternal separation from God. Sheol. No tortures there. No fires there. Simply any, a lightless prison where time is eternal. So there are three destinations for human souls. So the primary argument that agnostics have against God goes away when you look at what God said. This is a profound statement that those with religious mindset miss because they've had it indoctrinated into them that you either go to heaven or hell. That's not what God said. He said the consequence of ignoring his instructions is you'll die. Now, that's exactly the conditions that exist right now. God has provided for our edification, his Torah teaching, his guidance. That's where we're reading this story. And he has told us, just as he told Abraham, that if you embrace the five terms and conditions that exist for participation in the covenant, then you're going to be empowered and enriched, adopted into God's eternal family, be perfected by him and become immortal, but living forever. For us today, the same thing is true as was true here. If we pay attention to what God is offering, we accept it, we live forever. If we don't, we die. It's that simple. It's that fair. It's that appropriate. So why is it, since God did not say that regarding his uh, instructions, that, uh, that by disregarding his instructions that there would be eternal suffering, God said no such thing. Why has every mainstream Christian religious derivation, whether it be Catholic or Orthodox or Protestant or Evangelical, why do they officially teach that those who reject God are damned to an eternity of being tortured in hell? Why do they say that? Why do they make their God into a liar? Why do they make their God sadistic? Because Yahweh said just the opposite. You know, the opposite of eternal suffering in hell is dying and ceasing to exist. They are not subsets of each other. They're mutually exclusive options. And yet, the Christian God is sadistic. Only a demented deity would say, love me or I'll torture you. Now, as it turns out, hellish torture is a derivative of the Babylonian religion, as are the preponderance of Christian corruptions of God's teachings. Not only is the Hebrew word for death repeated twice in this patches, passage, muth is the antithesis of living forever. Therefore, if the church is right, God is wrong. It is that simple. It's that obvious. It's that cut and dry. And yet not one religious cleric in a million comprehends this divine mandate. When I first wrote that the consequence of ignoring Yahweh's Torah instructions is death, not eternal damnation. And began to share that with Christians I had come to know along the way. Just smoke would come out of their ears. Never heard such a thing. Not possible. Just couldn't even comprehend it. And yet it's ubiquitous everywhere. God says the same thing. He's always consistent. It's always the same message. Hundreds, if not thousands of times, he says exactly the same thing. And yet they can't process it. They don't much like the God, the religious types, who authored these words. You know, it's almost as if the fear that religions engender by errantly presenting their own religious hell, serves their interest by frightening the faithful into compliance and to contributions, to tithes, to indulgences. Or please explain, why else would they promote the same lie? Why is every Islamic cleric, every Christian cleric, why are they all promoting the same lie? if it isn't to empower and enrich them. 
as we progress through yada yada, and the material that we're covering now is in the first volume of yada yada, we will continue to discover that the overwhelming evidence that Yahweh provides lists three consequences related to the choices we make, not two. Therefore, it is reasonable to conclude there must be three, not two, potential fates that await human souls. The most often presented and most common result is death, the cessation of life, just as it was depicted in this first statement regarding the consequence of ignoring God's instructions. Those who choose not to yada yawa, to know yawa, to trust and rely upon yah, to live, will live for a very short while. But ultimately, death will be the end of their existence. Upon their mortal demise, their souls will cease to exist. God doesn't know them, and they don't know God. I don't know if you've ever been beside a person that breathed their last breath. But you can watch this happen. For the overwhelming preponderance of people, there will be no eternal life in the Heavenly Father's home, nor hell by any definition. As Yosh explained, the way is broad, and many there are who find death and destruction. Death and destruction is not damnation. It is not eternal suffering. Death is death. It's the destruction of the soul, the end of life. That is what most find. Yosha said it. Yahweh said it. It is the truth. It is profound. It forever changes the way that God really is and how we should look at him. Welcome back to Shattering Mists. Throughout uh, the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms, and even in the two eyewitness accounts uh, written by one by uh, Yahu Khan and the other by Matanya, God constantly tells us that uh, the consequence of paying no attention to his Torah instructions is that upon our mortal demise, our soul will cease to exist. That's just a consequence, not a penalty. It just ceases to exist. No hell, no heaven. And that that's the overwhelming preponderance of human souls, that fate. Now, that doesn't mean that the other two better-known consequences don't exist. They do. There is a place of eternal anguish. Now, the anguish is not caused by tortures. God's not there. He's not torturing anyone. It's not like Islam, where Allah spends all of his time in hell perpetrating savage tortures of the souls that are there. You know, every reference to Allah in the Quran, Allah is in hell. <laughs> Allah, indeed, is going to be in the Sheol, which is the actual name of the place. It was created for him because he was modeled after Hasatan, the adversary. The anguish that exists there is the eternal awareness that God actually does exist and that uh, is that the souls that are there, there who are predominantly religious, political, academic types, that they led people away from him, that they are being penalized by being incarcerated forever because they weren't victims, they were perpetrators. You know, God's not like Islam, where the victim of rape is incarcerated and the perpetrator of rape goes free. If you're a victim of religion, God says, no consequence, may no punishment for you. You're the victim of religion, I'm sorry. I don't know you, you don't know me. Upon the end of your earthly existence, hope you had a good time, hope you enjoyed it, because it's over. But if you were the pedophile, if you were the rapist, if you endangered that soul by promoting myths that enriched and empowered you and your institution, but were opposed to God and his covenant, then there's a penalty. There has to be. For God to be just, there has to be a penalty for doing that. And there is. It's a Sheol. It's a lightless place akin to a black hole, infinite in time. Nothing escapes. It is the closest allegory to God's presentation of Sheol. 
And only those who are actively engaged in leading people away from Yahweh, away from the Torah, away from his covenant, which would be most overtly religious and political and many media spokespeople as well as many of those in academia, they're going to endure this fate. They will join Hasatan, the adversary, and his false messengers, known as demons, in Sheol. If you go, it'll be the opportunity to meet every pope. If you go, you're going to find it. If you're religious, if you're political, you're going to love the place because it's a very religious and political place. The consequence of observing Yahweh's instructions and paying attention to his advice, acting upon it, is to live forever with him in a place that is conducive to life, that is extraordinarily satisfying. That's what Gani Don means. Those who rely on Yah become Yehudim, his children. That means related to Yah. They inherit all that he has to give through his covenant. After engaging on his behalf and serving with him during the millennial Shabbat, which will begin on the called invitation to be called out and meet of shelters in year 6,000 Yah, which is 2033 on our calendar, and ending 1,000 years later, we will all be equipped with God's Torah written inside of us so that we can camp out with him during the Shabbat. And when the final 1,000-year Shabbat, where the entire world, the entire earth is returned to the conditions that exist at the Garden of Eden, for our edification, for our enjoyment, for our eternity, God's going to create an entirely new universe. One this time where you and I, if we embrace God's instructions regarding life, regarding relationship, regarding our salvation, regarding camping out with Him, this time we will be witnesses. Now we are witnesses through His Torah testimony, but then with our own eyes we shall see the creation of the universe. play the music that's a little longer today than uh, normal as I sign off. I encourage you to think about what we learned, what God said, and what it means in terms of our relationship with Him. And I hope you choose to pay attention to His instructions and listen.